0621-1 GNC Special Lecture Expanded Grades and Training This is an Electronic Point One Club production of, of The Corded Lecture made by L. Ron Hubbard for presentation to the Grand National Convention of Dianetics and Total Freedom held in Los Angeles on June 21, 1970 it has been produced from the original reel-to-reel tape unedited. All world performance rights are granted. Hello. I want to welcome you to the Grand National Convention of the 20th Anniversary of Dianetics and Total Freedom. It takes me back to the days when I was here in Los Angeles. Uh, getting the show on the road in the old Dianetics Foundation. Uh, we had a hotel down at 2600 South Hoover. And uh, things went along very boomingly. Yes, I know tremendous numbers of people here in the Los Angeles area. Tremendous numbers of friends. Uh, I'm not a native son, but uh, I probably know more about California than most Californians. Uh, and certainly, certainly I've had a longer look at it than a great many people. You know, in the last half a century, I started out by going to school on a bucking bronco and uh, I'm winding up traveling around on jet planes and I think time has marched on but uh, we have today uh, something that has been enormously improved but is still with us and that's Dianetics. I want to Thank you for your great acceptance and welcome back of Dianetics. The difficulties of the last 20 years have not in any way impeded either the workability or the promises of Dianetics. And if you remember the last sentence of the book, Dianetics, Modern Science and Mental Health, which was published in 1950, as you will recollect, on May the 9th, the last words is, were, for God's sakes, build a better bridge. Well, I, I sort of waited around for 20 years, and you didn't build a better bridge, so uh, I did. And uh, today, in standard Dianetics, as it is taught at the L.A. Foundation, the L.A. Org, we call it now, is a very, very streamlined jet plane version of the original Dianetics. And I'm very glad that it uh, came back to life and... Uh, became so quickly full of life and was greeted so enthusiastically. So thank you very much for your reacceptance of our old friend Dianetics. During this convention, I understand, you are going to hear a tape that was made in the autumn of 1950 in California to a very, very large crowd of people. I think there were about 2,500 there. And in which I was laying out the basic fundamentals of Dianetics and getting the show on the road. I'm very glad that tape has been preserved. I also hope you will be able to hear at this convention a tape that was made on the actual birthday of Dianetics Modern Science and Mental Health, AD 20. AD, you know, stands for After Dianetics. 
this uh, might come as a, a bit of uh, strong meat to you, but uh, that was how I felt on that birthday. It's been a long road. It's been a very, very long road. The cycle of development of Dianetics and Scientology stems from the early 30s, of course, up to the publication of the original thesis. And the original thesis is a uh, basic book and originally did not mention either Dianetics or Scientology, but it had a very strange method of publication. People were hectographing that book, and you know hectographing is uh, printing things off in uh, purple ink and uh, getting purple on your face and on your hands. And uh, it's a very simple method of uh, mimeographing. And people were hectographing this book and shipping it around, and other people would then hectograph copies of this book and ship it around, and more people made copies of this book and shipped it around, and I think it is probably the most public domain copyright that anybody ever uh, had, because I have heard from this book all over the world, and I would, wouldn't be a bit surprised if the original thesis wasn't still being hectographed by somebody on some continent and shipped along as great news because it gives the hope of a breakthrough in the field of the mind. For several years I was catching up with this book occasionally uh, which was being mimeographed privately and individually and forwarded on as something of great interest. In other words, there was a forerunner to uh, Dianetics, Modern Science of Mental Health. It was the first formal publication. I suppose one of those old hectographed editions uh, by now has been translated into uh, Chinese, Indian, and several other things. But it had no specific name. It wasn't called Dianetics, and it wasn't called Scientology, and so people were not likely to connect it up. There's another amusing circumstance. Uh, as you know, in uh, 47, 48, 49, I was in the Hollywood area, where, of course, I was no stranger. I used to work for the movies while they still had movies in California. And uh, got TV now. But uh, I used to work for the, uh, around, up at... Uh, I think it was La Brea, and uh, about a block north or east or west of Sunset Boulevard, somewhere in that vicinity. And uh, I was doing research, and I collected quite, quite a lot of people, and I was auditing them, and uh, some of the first Dianetic clears were made in that area at that time. And then in 1950, when I came back, of course, when I was researching it in that area, I didn't know, uh, I didn't have any name for it, and uh, I didn't say I was anybody, and I was just picking up people at random and processing them, and they didn't know what was going on, and they were all intensely delighted, and their somatics were disappearing, and they were going upscale at a remarkable rate. I used to, by the way, get a lot of people audited uh, by the simple expedient of starting the case and finding out where somebody was and what he had to have run and then turn him over to somebody else in the back room to finish off the auditing. I used to have several sessions going on simultaneously. It was, it was, it was rather a wild scene. But anyway, anyway, when I came back to the Los Angeles area in 1950 with all the hurrah and, uh, uh, books in all the windows and uh, making appearances in all of the big bookstores and department stores with specially decorated stages and all that sort of thing. Why, uh, quite a few of these people uh, turned up with some curiosity and uh, 
Oh, is, is that what you were doing, you know? And uh, I remember a dear old lady that came up to me, and uh, she looked at me, and she went around to the other side of me, and she looked at me, and she went around to the front of me, and she looked at me again, and she says, Well, so that was your name. <laughs> I didn't know, but I hadn't even bothered to tell these people my name. Anyway, we heard for years from these people, one way or the other, and a lot of them were still on the line. But anyway, there's a lot of history, a lot of water over the dam, some of it amusing, some of it tragic, because the advent upon the world, the advent of Dianetics, into the world was certainly not uh, a calm uh, action. There were very, very many objections in various quarters to greet this tremendous enthusiasm. And in 1950, a very long and arduous subterranean warfare began with the vested interests and people who had a good reason for the United States not to recover, and a good reason why people and the human race shouldn't get any better. I didn't say very much about all this. I more or less kept my own peace. But for years, Literally years, it was the most remarkable thing how many newspaper reporters and how many magazine writers could write stories about a man that they had never interviewed. I have been quoted more often in print on things I never said to people who never even came to see me than I could easily count. Now, it is quite remarkable but I don't think I was ever interviewed by a newspaper reporter until the 60s in England. And yet you will find me marvelously quoted through that decade, the most inventive quoting anybody ever did. During the 60s, life became even more uh, hectic and uh, it became quite necessary to find out who these fellows were and to do something about it. In spite of all this, I kept my researches going, organizations kept going, Scientology was developed, and the basic techniques of CLEAR and the subject of CLEAR itself as an attainable action were developed I didn't neglect my job in any way, but in the 60s it became necessary to lift the rock and find out who these fellows were. Who was this? Because by this time I had estimated that they must be spending something on the vicinity of about a million dollars a year to do something and put down Dianetics and Scientology. And who, who, who could spend um, that much money? And it was true that they were spending that much money. And in order to survive at all, we had to do something about it. Now, we didn't really do anything drastic. We didn't go around with uh, a Chicago typewriter because it wasn't this kind of a war. It was the kind of a war whereby a newspaper reporter would be paid a certain amount of money to write a scurrilous story about Dianetics or Scientology or me, or where a hood would be hired to do something or other, or where the situation would be very uh, clouded up through some governmental agency. Somebody there, at, uh, 
all of a sudden it have a lot of money in his bank account. Uh, what alerted us to the amount of money is the original Dianetic Foundations went by the boards. A, a man received $500,000 into his bank account the day he closed them up. And I thought that was a remarkable amount of money. I was not at that particular time a director of, of the early foundations, but it seemed to me an awful lot of money to be spending. And as time marched on, it became, as I say, necessary to find out who was doing this. And that it was being done was uh, all too visible. But of course it wasn't visible to people at large. They were being treated to a technique known as disinformation. And this is the way it's done. You get a newspaper story, a bad newspaper story, and that is put in a file. And then another bad newspaper story is put in a file. And then another bad newspaper story gets written, and that is put in a file. And then all of these files are gathered up, and then they're presented to somebody in a government or something like that. And they can say, now you see, this proves conclusively that all of this is very bad. Well, nearly all the development of Dianetics and Scientology and all of their research was done in this kind of an operating climate. In other words, this was a hard slugging match. Now, I almost never put uh, flaps on the line, and I wouldn't probably be telling you all about this if it weren't for the fact that we seem to be winning this game. It seems to be, see, seems to be going in our favor. It does seem so. And just as I talk to you here, we have been told by the head of an inquiry and uh, it was convened on Scientology at the behest of our favorite friends, the enemy. Uh, we were told that uh, the uh, we had proved our case conclusively, and we were given to understand that that was the end of that. Well, that is, of course, an awful blow for the enemy. Now, in another country, in two other countries, actually, uh, whatever the enemy has done has amounted to exactly nothing. He has been even unable to enforce laws or bans or anything like that. Every place anything was banned or something like that, we have the organization is fully open and operating at this particular time. And we are told in another quarter that uh, we will be uh, treated very nicely indeed in England. And uh, I can't guarantee this, but we've just had a conservative victory in England, and the conservatives uh, have stated that they would lift all these immigration restrictions and so forth with regard to Scientologists. We will see, since that's a political promise, but of course, you know, the man who was supposed to be the next Home Secretary of England, Cabinet Minister, and so forth, as uh, is very friendly with us. Now, the point I'm making here, the point I'm making here is that uh, a tremendous attack was mounted during the 60s over various parts of the world, and it made it necessary for us to take unusual measures. And uh, we took them. And sometimes you are asked, well now, what, 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 what's Ron doing on a yacht? Why is he on a yacht? Uh, is this something strange or something like that? Well, actually, it just sort of grew up. At the beginning, we needed mobility, and uh, we found out that this was a good operating pattern, so we continued with our mobility. You'll hear a lot of stories about this, uh, but uh, most of them are uh, not true. Actually, we live a very, very calm life these days, and uh, most of the interest is what we're going to do about this or that through the world of Scientology and what we are doing, and uh, you owe your resurgence to Dianetics, the fact that I could research this quietly and efficiently with a great many friends and people who could assist me. But uh, the enemy 
the enemy, he isn't doing so well. He's not doing so well. And we didn't go down and shoot these fellows, but all of these fellows knew that they were actually playing on the wrong side, that they were attacking something that they shouldn't attack. And before now, I have seen someone uh, who was attacking uh, this subject uh, fold up rather suddenly and abruptly, and not because anything was done to him, but because he was ashamed of himself. So anyway, I've drawn you up a little roster of uh, the people who have fallen by the wayside in the enemy ranks. And I just wanted to cheer you up. And this is a sort of a little uh, sort of graveyard uh, obituary column, which I'm introducing into my lecture here today. But I thought it might interest you because, you see, we haven't had many casualties. And uh, starting in here at the beginning, we have Kenneth Robinson, the former Minister of Health, who banned foreign students from entry into England. And he was removed from this post and he was made Minister of Land, and uh, then he became Minister of Housing, and then he was dropped completely from Wilson's cabinet, and now Wilson has been dropped from the government. Uh, but uh, this was the end of one man's political career, and he was one of the prime instigators of this overseas. Uh, John R. Reese, he was the medical doctor and psychiatrist who was one of the prime movers in the formation of the World Federation of Mental Health in 1948, and who was their honorary president. And uh, uh, about a few months ago, he, he died. It's too bad. And uh, Brock Chisholm, Brock Chisholm was very interesting in this. You, ever, you remember Alger Hiss and Whitaker Chambers and all of those spy scares and communist scares that were in the State Department? Well, the pal of all of those fellows was Brock Chisholm. And Brock Chisholm started the World Health Organization in uh, uh, the UN. And they found out through the his connections and so forth, that he was uh, a little bit on the red side, and so they kicked him out, and he formed the World Federation of Mental Health, or at least he was president of it. He was one of its prime movers, and anyway, uh, he was very anti-Scientology, and the poor fellow, in the short time ago, became senile. Anyway, he's out of the running. And then there is Cecil King. Now, he was, uh, he managed the remarkable position of being a director of the Bank of England while being the head of the National Association of Mental Health, so called, which is a branch of the World Federation of Mental Health in England. And, uh, he, he was a big man. He was a very big man. And, uh, he, oh, he was a very big man. And he came to, uh, work one morning and found out that he had taken his finger off of his number and he was removed as chairman of the board of the newspaper chain, the London Daily Mail that had been clobbering us in England because uh, the the editor he put in to clobber us, uh, he, he reduced the circulation down to the point where the newspaper was going broke, so they got rid of him. And then there's Sir William Carr, and he was another newspaper magnet whose newspaper chain was grabbed in a takeover bid. And uh, he's had two serious operations lately. I think they've given him a, a heart, and uh, first time he had one, and uh, then that didn't work, I think, and they had to give him another heart, dog's heart, or something like that. And I think I heard that he had kicked the bucket, but I'm not sure about that. And then there was Andrew Jones, Andrew Jones, an MP in South Australia who recently lost his seat in Parliament to a Labour uh, candidate uh, who was ably assisted in his campaign by a Scientologist. It's too bad. Poor Andrew. And uh, Andrew uh, had been up on two charges of drunken driving and uh, was not able to publicly... Uh, uh, suppress his name in connection with him, and he was the one who kicked the ball rolling against Scientology in South Australia. And so he, he's, he's not with us anymore. Anyway, 
Then there's Eric Cunningham Dax, the great Dr. Dax, and uh, he's performed over a, a thousand uh, brain operations, you know, made a thousand zombies. And uh, he was the one who just scattered all over uh, down under, uh, getting a tremendous case going against Scientology. And uh, he's the one who began the Melbourne Inquiry. And uh, poor old Cunningham Dax, he's, he doesn't have any friends in Australia anymore, and he's gone down to the Mental Hygiene Authority in uh, Tasmania to uh, as an inspector of monkeys. I think that's pretty good. Anyway, he, he lost. So then there was Frank Fremont Smith and Jack Griffiths. And these were both strong World Federation mental health men in North America. And they both recently had strokes. Most remarkable thing. Both of them had strokes. And then there's poor old T.J. Stander. And he was the one who kicked the ball rolling against the inquiry in South Africa. And he was the big man down there. The... South African National Council for Mental Health, and uh, he, he lost all of his uh, government support. The government used to pay this outfit money, and this was the extension of the World Federation of Mental Health down there. And the government lost, he lost all the government stuff, and the government lost interest in him, and uh, he's pretty finished. And uh, then, then, of course, the fellow who started the Melbourne Inquiry in the first place, he made a full confession. He made a full confession of all of his lies and uh, connivings and forgeries and uh, uh, who put him up to it and so on. And then, not very long ago, down in uh, uh, Sydney, Australia, he dropped dead. And uh, so anyway, the enemy isn't suffering... Uh, any more than they should, and we haven't done this to them. But what I'm trying to show you is, this is just a roll call. Now, I told you on Iran's journals a long time ago that there were quite a few of these fellows, and uh, they were scattered around the world, and they were doing various things on the social front. Now, what these fellows were doing on the social front was trying to, apparently, uh, bring about enough unrest and so on to make it possible to take things over. And uh, we apparently ran head-on into an effort to knock out the West. And of course, if we succeeded, if we succeeded, why naturally they wouldn't have walked out, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't have knocked it out. So what I'm, what I'm talking about here is uh, the strange coincidences of all of this. And the fact that the campaign which is directed against the West and the one which you're involved with in the United States right this minute and is cluttering up your streets with uh, uh, dissent and dissidents and is making it dangerous to walk out at night, the uh, spiritual background of this and the philosophy which uh, was introduced, which caused this, is... Uh, the same one. Now, what do you know about that? So anyway, I like to keep you up to date. I like to keep you up to date. That, that I won't mention that again. That's our obituary section. Uh, we're not trying to prove that uh, he who strikes Scientology uh, bayonets himself at the same time, nor are we saying necessarily that if we got rid of all these cats, since they've had about 20 years to work, or well, they've been working at it longer than that, uh, that everything would be cool, calm, and collected in the United States. This is not necessarily true. But had they never lived, things would be cool, calm, and collected in the United States. Oh, there's one other I forgot. There's some, some newspaper reporter that used to write things in some magazine or another. I've forgotten what magazine. It's, it's, it's defunct, too. Uh... And he turned up in Prague the other day and published a book, Brainwashing the West, How uh, I Am Striking the Blow for Communism. Well, the funny part of it is, is these fellows really aren't communists, you see. They're really not communists. They're sort of an offshoot 
of the uh, general pattern. And uh, they had their own idea of how the world should be run because uh, Russia isn't mad at us. Russia isn't mad at us at all, which is quite interesting. Russia is so unmad at us that uh, not very long ago we started publishing books in uh, Warsaw and uh, our books were greatly welcomed at a book fair in Russia itself and uh, in knocking around the world why we're very often uh, cheek by jowl with Russian ships and uh, they are very friendly people there they're not the least bit upset about it. So what I think is, is their revolution must have gotten parked someplace in America. And uh, the chaps whose names I have been mentioning here uh, sort of are on that main line. It might surprise you to know, however, that uh, this list I've been reading you and talking to you about and so on, these fellows are really uh, not Mr. Big in all of this. And we're going on down that trail now and seeing if we can't do something about him. So anyway, I'll, this is like a continued story. Remember Perils of Pauline, you know, cliffhangers? Well, I'm going to give you a cliffhanger right there because uh, uh, there will be another chapter yet to write. And when we have finally written this chapter, I can assure you that things are going to be a lot calmer in the United States. In other words, we got tired of being shot at, and we didn't have to shoot back. People were very accommodating about the whole thing. Now, I'd like to tell you, I'd like to tell you something much more interesting. We reissued Dianetics as standard Dianetics, much refined, much sleeker, much more workable, in 1969. Now, that was a second time that there had been in recent times a very great improvement on the subject of the technology. The first uh, action on this, of course, was many, many years ago when we came out with CLEAR and the OT grades. Now, it became apparent after a while that this needed a very highly precise, uh, highly uh, developed form of auditing, and we released, I developed and uh, released the Class 8 materials and trained quite a few Class 8s. And uh, they like to uh, exaggerate the uh, terrors they went through <laughs> to learn all this. But uh, actually, it's very interesting as they didn't look very terrified to me. Uh, I think some people have you on about what goes on <laughs> around the Sea Org and the flagship. Uh, I never myself see so many smiling faces or... Uh, advancing cases or more uh, ARC environment than you see uh, around the flagship of the Sea Org. But anyway, Class 8 materials were released and uh, they were basically intended to help out the clear and OT levels. And then I went completely to the opposite end of the spectrum and I released uh, developed and released standard Dianetics, which you saw in 1969. And now, in 1970, you are right here at the opening guns of the revival and re-standardization of Scientology lower grades. Now, lower grades expanded is what this development is, and it gives us an enormous width and an enormous breadth to the subject between Dianetics and Clear and OT. Now, it just happens that this development is not, uh, not very much of a development, really, because all it consists of is everything that was done with and about Scientology happens to be basic material. It isn't historical material. It isn't background material. It isn't this and it isn't that. It is simply uh, basic factual material. And people over a period of time got so they were calling this uh, uh, background and uh, old and so on. And as a result, they began to give lower grades uh, rather 
uh, sketchily. And there are people around who have not properly made their lower grades and who actually have not uh, achieved all they could achieve in that particular field or zone. And there even are some people who have moved up toward OT who are having a great deal of difficulty making it simply because they went through their lower grades too fast. Well, now, of course, lower grades today amount to much more than they have for a long time. But the classification chart, I think it's called the classification gradation chart, of 1968, it's been reissued in 69, it's being reissued again. There are many issues of this chart call for certain definite abilities. And uh, those abilities actually are not gainable in uh, two and a half minutes or 20 minutes from zero to four. Those are just quickie grades. And a better look at this thing is that it actually is uh, a lot of hours. I don't know how many processes there are that actually run from zero to four. But by putting those all in, we get what you might call expanded lower grades. And these expanded lower grades run in a sort of a harmonic into the OT levels so that you can actually pick them up again in the OT levels, but they can all be put in right in the first place. So what you see right now is a revival of this particular strata of technology, and it is the, all the technology which exists between uh, Dianetics and Advanced Courses Clear, and it is a large span of material. A lot of old-timers will be very, very glad to hear this, and a lot of newcomers will feel uh, relieved when they realize that the two and a half minutes which they had spent on this particular band should have been better and more like 50 to 100 hours. Now the best, the best way to handle this is uh, just get them checked and have expanded lower grades run if you are at all doubtful in any way at all as to having made them. Now I will not say I will not say that this is simply old material which is being revived. That is too simplified a statement. Actually, there is a way to case supervise this which is brand new and which gets a person into a very uh, high condition and then shoots him up even higher. But we are utilizing this material which has been for some years referred to as old or not used anymore or historical or gone or something like that. Actually, actually none of the processes which were developed over those years are uh, useless and uh, the bulk of them are vitally necessary. You will be also very glad to hear that uh, there is a new uh, OT1, OT2, and uh, that handles uh, uh, in most of the difficulties one runs into in three. And uh, you will also be glad to know that just as soon as I am very sure that we have lower grades expanded back in to Scientology class four orgs, and just as soon as I am sure that uh, uh, the St. Hills are in a, a, a fully operative uh, condition and are teaching all of those materials as they should, why then we will re release OT7 and OT8. We're not ready for those yet, and uh, I have done them, but I am not uh, releasing them until we have lower grades expanded and fully worked over. There's one thing at a time uh, is the motto on which I am operating. So anyway, these are very good uh, tidings. And I'm very glad to be able to give them to you, because recently, in just the last year or two, I have run into some people who had the idea that lower grades were something that were given very quickly, and they got rid of those very rapidly, and uh, that isn't true. They aren't. Actually, the distance between a uh, man in the street and a humanoid is simply uh, Dianetics up to what you call grade four of the lower grades. And by the time anybody got to grade four, why well, he should have quite a 
quite a distance between himself and the uh, fellow walking out there in the street. He certainly should no longer be a humanoid. Now, to prove that contention, I recently was able to uh, make a breakthrough, and this is something else which is of considerable technical interest to you. I found out that uh, it's rather amusing, actually, because there were some cases that were having an awful lot of trouble. Oh, they were having terrible trouble. Oh, my. And uh, they couldn't figure out what was wrong with them and so on. I went over these cases and researched the thing through, and I made a breakthrough. And it's a technical breakthrough, actually, of some magnitude. You'll run into it when you see it. But I found out that we were much better, much better than we thought we were. The truth of the matter is that in some lower grade areas and in some Dianetic areas uh, and uh, in very early uh, processing, we, we were making, we were making Thetan exteriors. They weren't really OTs, but they certainly were exterior and people hadn't been noticing this. And they hadn't been noticing this to the degree that they were going right straight on processing people on past this particular point. And that was pretty gruesome. We uh, were long aware that you shouldn't really process a person past the point of exterior. If this fellow went exterior, why, it was an end phenomena in itself. And he shouldn't be processed past this point, and uh, he had already become aware of himself as a Thetan, and uh, if you processed him further than that, why, you tended to do him in. And this advice somehow or other got lost. And uh, there's a lot of Scientologists uh, and Dianeticists that will quote this one, when all else fails, do what Ron said. Well, I've been telling them for a long time, don't process people past exterior. And I found out that this had become common practice. Somebody would go exterior, and then uh, he would get more processing, and uh, a lot of difficulty would develop. Now, of course, exterior means the fellow would just move out uh, away from himself and be aware of himself as independent of a body, but still able to control and handle the body. And... Uh, it is quite a state all by itself. It is not, by the way, the state of clear. Just because a fellow is exterior is no reason that he has gone clear. That is not true. Uh, you can have, strangely enough, a Thetan exterior who is not even vaguely clear, who will have to work for quite a while to get to clear. So if that is the case, then how do you take somebody who is uh, an exterior who is exterior to his body, if he can't be audited after he exteriorizes, and if he is not clear, even though exteriorized, then how is he ever going to get up and become clear? Well, that, that's one. So I had to work this over, and I finally found out what it was. And I resolved this, and uh, it has been working marvelously and has been uh, put into some orgs and there is a considerable campaign which is just now being launched in order to uh, pick this up, uh, pick up this point and handle it. It does not take very long to handle. I found what the technical difficulty was in handling it. And there was a technical difficulty. Anyway, all of that material is actually available in most orgs today and is called an interiorization rundown. And uh, what it does is take the person so that he can uh, be audited past the point of having gone exterior, and oddly enough, it exteriorizes an awful lot of people very, very rapidly, and then they go on up the line. Uh, the end, end product of this rundown, by the way, is not necessarily going exterior. But if a person does go exterior, he can still be audited, and that was necessary. And I'm getting very rave notices, very rave notices on this technology. This is, uh, this is of great interest because it tells you that there are two zones where Scientology, uh, might have, uh, uh, might have been in in uh, some trouble with somebody. In other words, 
this person doesn't feel well or something. Well, one of the ways he wouldn't feel well is to think that he had his lower grades and he hadn't had his lower grades. Now, that would be one way. And the other way would be uh, to have exteriorized during processing and then gone on and been audited past that point without this uh, remedy being done on him. And uh, that would also make him feel rather bad. Actually, there's another one, which is, uh, it isn't actually a technical difficulty, but pretty horrible, is every now and then, I understand it was being done in the Los Angeles area for a while, but every now and then, uh, somebody has been told that he has gone clear on Dianetics. Well, now, of course, there is such a thing as a Dianetic clear, but it is not a Scientology clear, and a person has not gone clear until he has uh, been on the clearing course in Scientology. But what we were making, what we were making as a Dianetic clear, actually, there's more to it than that. But Dianetic clears actually exist, and it's perfectly true, don't you see, that after a person has been audited for a while, uh, quite a while on Dianetics, that he can go clear. He's a Dianetic clear. And uh, this Dianetic clear, however, is not the same as a Scientology clear. There were two different kinds of clear in this matter. And in the Los Angeles area, I understand that some uh, fellows were actually trying to feed the data and cognition to people who had gone and become a Dianetic clear. They had actually tried to feed them data to make them think that they had hit the upper level of clear. And uh, it, it had some rather bad repercussions, actually. Uh, these people felt quite spinny. They, they knew, basically, that they had not uh, made it. And yet they were being told by people they had made it and so on. There, the percentage of people who go totally clear in Dianetics is too slight uh, to to give it much attention. Uh, now I'm talking about the state of absolute clear. So you'll get the idea that there are two kinds of clears. Well, that's true. True. There is the Dianetic clear who is without somatics, and uh, he feels great. And uh, then as you go on up the line, why there is a higher a state of clear, which is reached as a Scientology clear. And some years ago, this was clarified, and we called the Dianetic clear, we called him a release. And this was more uh, truthful in the matter. Nevertheless, book one is absolutely correct. There is such a thing as a Dianetic clear, and he does have those abilities if you continue to process him properly on Dianetics. And that is a Dianetic clear, and you move on up the line, and you will hit a Scientology clear. And actually, the type of clear which you're looking for is a Scientology clear, not a Dianetic clear. Well, you realize, of course, that an auditor an auditor actually shouldn't be evaluating for anyone, and uh, a case supervisor or an examiner and so on is not supposed to evaluate. He's not supposed to tell a person what he has achieved and so on. You know that. And uh, what I'm talking about, uh, the difficulty was that some of this evaluation was going on, and we caught up with it. Well, right now, right now, I, I think I think I have uh, uh, told you. Uh, at, I will admit, a very great rate of speed, I think I have told you uh, most of the news in which you would be interested. Here at the convention, of course, I am very happy to uh, uh, be able uh, to let you meet uh, Diana and uh, Clinton Hubbard. And this uh, pair of Hubbards are very, very accomplished Hubbards. You might not recognize it, and you might think it is simply press agentry, but the truth of the matter is that these two uh, diminutive little beings are uh, very hot uh, subjects at their own right. Quinton, without much doubt whatsoever, and he would squirm and uh, look embarrassed, but without much doubt is probably uh, the uh, top eight auditor of the world. People are very, very uh, fond of him and fond of his auditing, and he sort of came up this way naturally. 
his uh, basic uh, uh, interest as airplanes and other things, but he rolled up his sleeves and he decided he would become uh, a great auditor, and he proceeded to do so, just like that. So uh, don't ask him, don't ask him to evaluate for you case-wise, and uh, don't ask him embarrassing questions. Uh, but uh, the truth of the matter is why we are very uh, proud of him. And it was not because I said he was a good auditor. People start uh, telling you this, and... Uh, making comments along in this particular direction and the auditors of course that he's auditing alongside of are some of the best eights in the world who are here on flag you may not realize it but flag is uh better equipped technically and is basically a technical base and is more interested in technical actions than in any other single action so he came up the hard way he, he really had to batter his way up the line Every time somebody made a goof, why they said, well, that was Quentin, he did it, and uh, he's been this and that and the other thing on the ship, and there's one place where he can't be battered down, and that is in the field of tech or as an auditor. Now, the other one, the other one, my big little girl, uh, Diana, is... Uh, a very very competent person on her lines she has the management of uh, all of the PR uh, organizational divisions in the world and she has to handle all of these lines and keep them sitting on their pedestals and she does that very competently and actually where every other uh, aide here at flag was handling only one opposite numbered divisions. She was in fact handling three, division six, uh, seven, and eight. And uh, her her uh, presence in the lineup is very very uh, valuable. And we send her to you with uh, <laughs> with considerable reservations because all the time she'll be gone why there will be things popping here or there she actually is one of the best conning officers or ship handling officers in the sea org and that means considerable because we handle of course a lot of ships and she is very good in that line of country the other day uh, she uh, had to brush up on her celestial navigation and for just a little while was uh, not in command on a bridge and she felt very rest very very restless about this but she's been at this for quite some time and she could probably show uh, most of the naval captains who were around uh, a thing or two about ships these are quite upstat uh, uh, these are quite upstat kids. They are very, very good Thetans, and uh, we thought that we had better uh, send them over and uh, say hello for us. And any greeting they bring you and so on is a direct message from me, of course. The biggest, the biggest problem we have is uh, what we are going to do with the entire field of mental healing uh, which we're inheriting. And uh, I might as well uh, end this talk to you by asking you what you are going to do about it. Now, of course, you're surrounded by universities. That is, say, I think they're universities. Uh, from what I see of them, they seem to be mostly on strike or something. But uh, they're all talking about authority and uh, how they are uh, planning things and so on. But these fellows are giving you the same think, the same identical think that is coming from the World Federation of Mental Health and that we're backing right off the map. Now, we are making tremendous progress in this. Don't underestimate the amount of progress and the amount of impact which we're having on world society at this particular time. If we are going to make a sane world out of it, and if we are going to clear this planet, we have to ask this question. 
What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do with this planet? Now that's asking a bit much, but you are actually riding the tail end of the hurricane, which was made by the men who were attacking us over the last 20 years. And that hurricane has blown up to considerable heights in the United States. Not a hurricane around Scientology, but a hurricane in the society itself. These poorly dressed kids on the sidewalk, uh, these little badges, uh, I belong to the silent majority, uh, the other signs, uh, the unwillingness to go out in the evening, uh, the police who don't uh, think they can handle it, and so on. You're looking there, you're looking there at what came about under the rule of the fellows that we have been fighting, and it is those same chaps, it's those same fellows that uh, are causing that same turmoil in the United States. Now, I'm not trying to drum up uh, support in knocking them down. We have all but knocked them down. These fellows will not today, according to my advices, even open their faces about Dianetics and Scientology. They have been told to shut up, and they, are, they have not been told to shut up by us. But they are not talking. But their influence, their influence is a dying influence. They started their hurricane. Now it is dying out. And that is the truth of it. That hurricane is dying out. You are looking at the tail end of it. Scientologists and Dianeticists in the world rank in the upper tenth of the upper tenth of the world's intelligence population the most intelligent people in the world. That is happens to be the truth. We have very carefully categorized it. Now, maybe the society has fallen way downstairs, and maybe the society isn't as bright as it used to be, perhaps, but uh, we're nevertheless, if that were the case, we've been left on a pinnacle. We're certainly the upper tenth of the upper tenth, and that is the fact. And we have to worry now and think now about what are we going to do about it. Now, that doesn't mean that we should get out and start riots and civil commotions and so on. But we do have tremendous influence. And when we use that influence, we can influence things for good. And we should influence them in the direction of good. We were not idly fighting an enemy just to have a fight. We were actually fighting the evil basic point of the society, which was destroying it. And we have to ask now, what are you going to do about it. The reason why we ask it as you are going to do about it is because you actually are a basic power movement. You are probably the strongest uh, movement on the face of the planet today. The old movements have all decayed, they've gone downhill, they have lost their grip, and that again leaves you on a pinnacle. Now I'm not trying to scare you to death and tell you that you have to take full responsibility for all this, but I will tell you this, you are able to do something about all this. You can handle the drug case. What I wish you would do is get trained up, don't just sit back and relax and get processed and wait for something to happen. Get trained up, ready yourself up, know what you're talking about, use standard Dianetics, expanded grade Scientology, clear OT levels, to move it on up the line, because you have a whole society. It is going downhill rapidly. It is up to us to pick it up, let me show you how simple it might be to pick it up, and it might be very, very simple to pick it up. If you just took all the welfare funds, those tens of billions of welfare funds, and if you knocked off all the war funds, and you started to use those welfare funds to give people jobs and to build up America instead of going abroad and messing into other people's lives, if you started to build up America with all of the present appropriation, what a country it would be, what a country it would be. So there is a solution to the situation at an economic and governmental level if the government would only listen. But oddly enough, the government listens to you. Not very long ago, you might not have realized it, but one of the suggestions of President Nixon was directly from uh, us, and he gave it to the country about downstats. It's very interesting. We do have influence. This country can be built back up. The country has to get the idea that it can't just give everybody a handout. 
people have got to work their way through the world. But if this country were to spend its relief funds on jobs, if it were to spend its war funds on the actual reconstruction of America, it would be, in fact, what it was always intended to be, the greatest country in the world. So what are you going to do about it?